I had played Lady Macbeth on the radio a couple of times and I had been asked to play her in a couple of other productions, I think. I think that's right in saying. And that's what happens. Sometimes a part just keeps nagging at you until the formula becomes perfect. And there was, it was a very tempting formula, Tony Sher and Greg Doran and the swan. And um, other than that, we knew nothing. I mean, I just took it on those grounds. Um, what I did say was that it, I found it was very necessary to, um, I think in my first conversation with Greg, I said, is Tony prepared to look as though he needs me? <laughs> because if your if you're Macbeth doesn't need, or if you get an actor, because I think that had happened to me before, and if you get a, a Macbeth who thinks it's all about Macbeth, then Lady Macbeth gets sidelined and, and feels pretty impotent, the actress. And of course, I from that sentence onwards, I mean, I needn't have worried because I think that was what all of us found very rich was the um, the dynamics of the couple and how that shed light on the whole play. Not just wasn't doing me a favour, making my time as an actress better. It was actually um, it's how the play is written. It's how it has to be. It's so hard to to know where to begin when you're groping towards a character. I, um, with Shakespeare, it is sort of almost incantation of the words so that they go into your bloodstream. And um, I went on wild winter walks. No, actually, there were summer walks. Winter would have been more appropriate, but I went on sort of um, to try and contact something very elemental in the character because she doesn't have the sort of um, data that you have with other characters, you know, age 42, twice divorced, you know, uh, red-haired and dresses in tweeds or whatever it is. You, know, you don't have that kind of character breakdown. And Shakespeare gives her no backstory, really, and no companion to whom she can confide what's going on in her heart. Um, she does soliloquise, but she doesn't confess in soliloquy. She has about five lines when she actually bears her heart. Um, so she doesn't kind of release her secrets very easily, and it's as though she came ready-made as a package into Shakespeare's head, and he wasn't interested in what she does behind the scenes or when she's not on stage, if you see what I mean. She's a real theatre invention. Um, and there are other characters that you play who you can sort of imagine what they're like uh, in other situations where they've just come from, where they're just going to, what's their favourite colour. You know, with her, all that's irrelevant. It's really only what she does in the moment on stage and how she affects Macbeth. And so there's very little you can do in preparation before you get into rehearsal with your counterpart. But what I did do was just, just encant these frightening words. They're frightening. They still frighten me. The rhythms and the kind of the, the murkiness of the language. Hell is murky. I mean, that's a, it's just the spooky words. And um, it helped get me out of me and into some foreign territory. There are several often asked and never quite satisfactorily answered questions about the Macbeths. One is, have they had children? If so, where are they? Did they die? Does she refer to, when she says, I've given suck, is she talking about... Macbeth's child, or did she have another child? Historically, she had another child, but that's not really the most fruitful um, way of looking at it theatrically. It um, so the rehearsals were very much about uncovering these mysteries at the heart of the characters, and um, we had a wonderfully some wonderfully sort of revelatory moments where something that was an acting problem or a puzzle in quite, I think, both cases, Tony's head, where he said, how do I get from this point to this point, um, would, would unearth through discussion um, uh, something much deeper than had it, had it been acted more facilely, if you see what I mean. So there was um, this question of when um, Macbeth gets cold feet at the banquet and just 
dashes out and she follows him and says, what the hell's going on? And he says, I'm not going through with it. And within a space of five pages, not, not five pages, depending on it, a very short space of time, he has flipped to, OK, I'll do it. And there's a burden on the actress to find, you know, what is it, what is it about my argument or my personality or my charisma that or my power that, that manages to turn him round when he's got such good arguments against it. And for the actor, it's, it's equally sort of, um, you know, why, if I've got this conscience about doing this, is, is, am I so easily swayed by this woman? And so we both had the problem, and we both found the heart of the matter around this issue of the child, because it's almost as though she brings up as an emotional last dart she can get him on. Um, you know, this real emotional, we used it as an emotional blackmail, that they were both in great pain about um, a, a child who they'd lost. And I argued in my own head that there were more than one, that she was one of these women who could never quite bring it, in, bring a child to fruition. And, and, and that it was a great source of personal agony to both of them. And it was a very intimate, unspoken, coded sort of awful chasm. That, and, and if you take it that far, then somehow everything suddenly got solved. He has to go go through with it because he feels terribly sorry for her, and um, you know their marriage suddenly finds a way of um, finding a purpose again, having lost it through you know it's a it's a barren marriage, and yet somehow this business of going for the crown could give them a new lease of life. It could, you know, it's better than going to relate. You know, they found this this really good. Um, mutually beneficial kind of cause. She didn't put the thought in his head, that's very, very important, that is often a misconception. She did not put the thought in his head, she knew the thought was there, and there's masses of proof in the text that that's the case. And um, she's gone down in history as the one who, you know, put the idea in his head, and that's inaccurate. Her cleverness was to know that it was in his head already, and to give him the courage to do it. She sort of was full of steel at the beginning because she didn't really know what she was talking about, and um, she didn't. She knew Macbeth had ambition in him. She knew he had all sorts of qualities that she could bring out of him and harness. But she didn't know he was quite, quite the monster he turns out to be.